it's um, a couple minutes after we have coaches joining on here. Um, I think uh, the purpose of this session was really to have a discussion building off of your presentation from last week, which was very interesting. So thanks for that. And, um, and yeah. I wrote down some topics, uh, some questions that came up towards the end of that session that we didn't have a chance to get to that we wanted to cover today and then a couple more. But for our coaches, I think it's an open, open forum. If uh, anyone has any questions to ask, I think the simplest might be just to unmute and, uh, and, and fire away. Um, you know, I think I would like to start with the questions that uh, a couple of our coaches posted uh, last week that we didn't get to. Um, and the first one of those that I saw was um, balancing structured and unstructured training at uh, youth ages. I think it was one that we we talked about there, and um, and if you have if that's an interesting one, I think I'm going to talk about a little bit there. That's we have a very large um, part of our club is is under ten years old. I guess yeah. to understand, right? We have a huge number of a uh, huge percentage of our community participates at that age. So more than half the kids in steamboat here are skiing and snowboarding um, through our club at that age. Um, so we have um, a lot of kids out here under the lights at house and um, being introduced to the sport and trying to develop that love for it. And also on a, on a pathway with some dreams for big things. So we're trying to balance that, uh, that play with, with the structure that they need to, to develop their, their skill um, towards their, their goals. So if that, if that's something that uh, would be a good conversation topic. Yeah, yeah. No, it's an, it's, it's an interesting one. And it's kind of, as I said earlier, it's also a little bit context dependent because if you want, I think if you want skills, want kids to, to have motivation, long-term motivation and to really kind of... Um, Continue in, in ski, snow sports and, um, and to grow there, you need to learn them skills. They need to feel that they kind of get progress, they can master new things, they um, have positive experiences. So it's kind of, you need to provide them a foundation. Um, so I think um, uh, when you have them on, on kind of organized sessions, it's important to use that, those in a good way. And um, I think for, for the young age, we often call it kind of the fundament, uh, providing them with the fundament, which should be fun, but it also, also should kind of be the foundation um, skill-wise. Um, so I think in, in the organized sessions, it's, um, uh, it is, a, of course, important to, uh, psychologically and socially they are kids so kind of to use games to play with them to kind of not make it too serious to make sure it's fun but at the same time organize it uh, in a way that they actually learn something so they actually get better um, and as i said last time i, I really kind of i i think exactly the same way uh, planning uh, sessions for kids as i do for uh, those working towards the Olympics because you just use the different pedagogics and you organize things a little bit different, but um, but you really need to think through what type of skills should they learn and then what kind of games and, and, uh, and um, exercises do we give them so that they can actually learn those um, skills. Um, and, and then you can do that in multiple ways and it's kind of you can do so many cool stuff that makes them have action, full gas, motivation, uh, not much talk, 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 but lots of activity. But then you need to plan that and then organize it so you can develop the skills that you want. Um, and I think the other part of it is actually to gradually also motivate them to play themselves. Um, and that's what I talked about too. If you can get the kids on board, neither the parents um, on board, so that um, the parents bring them to snow in the weekends, uh, so they kind of 
when it's snow outside, they kind of buy them a pair of, it doesn't have to be racing skis, it can just be skis to play with. Um, um, and that also the kids have learned a few things during the sessions that you motivate them to try out more at home. Um, I, th I think personally, it's smart to give the parents a little bit of education so that because it, it's limited what you can do in organized sessions. So if you're able to kind of um, motivate also the parents to 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 organize activities, unorganized activities for them, I think that's um, that's really cool. And of course, if you have a snow park, for example, where yeah, at, le at least I know from from my kids when they are they are in that age, uh, seven and nine, and if I if I kind of go ski a skiing tour with them, then they get bored. Um, but if we say, let's um, see if we can go to the club clubhouse today, it's uh, it's uh, five kilometers, and then we drink. Uh, we have a, a hot chocolate. Then, of course, there's no problem to go, and then we meet their friends as well up there. Then they go five kilometers off, or I just or I don't tell them that we go up. I, I only focus on. We are actually skiing down today. We just have to walk up first, and that would be really cool to go down the steep hills, back down. Um, or if we cannot take them to the snow park where there are ski jumps, there are lots of different activities, um, and I, then they are active for an hour, and I kind of I don't see them. They just play, and I put on them a, a GPS watch, and I see that they ski more kilometers alone in the ski park then they ski when I try to drag them around the, the course. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know, I think it's the more you can activate them on skis, the more they, they can kind of try out stuff, um, the better. But of course, if everything is organized, I think it will also kill their motivation because we need to find that that good balance, and the parents is of course a key here. Um, yeah, I like the idea of structuring the training to provide that skill, but also the motivation for them and their parents to do more outside of our structured training, so that they're getting that that play and that unstructured time, maybe away from our our the the programming, the training that we're providing, right? Instead of having yeah to do that in that really valuable time that we have with them, which is short. Yeah, great. I don't I don't know how you do this, but I, I just feel that if you kind of if the parents are kind of part of the team, um, they are kind of to have just give them some lecture. It's just an easy thing. It's kind of like so they you make sure that the kids bring a, a dry shirt after the skiing session, that they have something to drink afterwards, to eat, learn them these small routines. Um, maybe. Maybe, maybe just these small things that try to eat dinner or what you eat at least an hour before the session so they don't come kind of and get stomach problems. It's just these small things that makes gives the kids so much better feeling when they are on, on training. Um, and also if they're sick, just tell them if they're sick, keep them at home. Don't bring them to <laughs> do basic stuff, but kind of if you team up with them and make them part of the team, also that they speak positively about the coaches. Uh, if there are some kids kind of, they are not functioning well or that they kind of don't feel comfortable that you get a constructive feedback from the parents. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, and maybe even have ski courses for them because if the, if the parents are interested in, in skiing themselves, then <laughs> it's, so, it's such a big a chance that they kind of, Spend their weekends on snow. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I think that's great advice. Um, Blair or Nicole, I think one of you had a question about uh, grouping athletes by age or ability. And I might be wrong who asked that, but do you want to get to that one? It's kind of a, you know, a, that's a question that we has come up a few times. Um, with some of our presenters about long-term athlete development, Oyvind, and also skill development is- I, um, I, think, yeah, it was, uh, I yeah. think it was Carl that actually- Okay, yeah. With Nordic Combine. Yeah. 
Okay. It was a very, Carl or Garrett, I think it was very appropriate though of age or ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if it's not a combined or ski jumping, it's pretty obvious that you kind of, if I start ski jumping uh, at the age of 41, 42, then I probably need to start in the small hills. <laughs> if you, I don't start in, and, and then the 12, 12, 12 year old boys and girls, they probably jump in the 90, 90 meter hill. So, so of course it's, it's kind of, um, in such events, you just need to do it a little bit by, by skill. Otherwise you kind of put, you, you don't give enough challenge to the, to those who are come a bit ahead and you give too much challenge to those who are started a little bit later. So, um, so of course then you need to do it. And then I think for other sports, it's, I think also alpine skiing, for example, it's at some point you need to distinguish a bit kind of those who are coming a bit further than those who are not coming further, just to give them the, uh, the right type of challenges so they can develop further on, on the level they are at. Um, then it's of course the balance with kind of the technical, their technical level, their physiological level, and then on the other hand, kind of their social and psychological development and they're part of the group and they are probably going to school together and and even you, you don't want to kind of say that you are the talents and you are not the talent so we put you in different groups you're a talent so you play with the big ones it's kind of kind of in my opinion finding a philosophy where you can give people um the right type of challenge so they are uh, not bored if you see that they get bored in the group they're all or they need more challenges you need to kind of at least make sure that they can develop further but then at the same time balance that with they do have friends at their own age and they bond together they go to school together and try to keep still keep them together as a group um and it depends a bit on sports. I think in cross-country skiing, for example, as I'm used to, I think at least up to the age of 12, you can may mostly have them together and then you differentiate during the sessions how you do things. If you do relays, you just make sure that not all the good ones are the same team. And so you can quite easily kind of put them into differentiate in different groups and, and make good sessions for everyone without having big troubles. But then maybe alpine skiing is a little bit in the middle and then you can take the ski jumping part, which is really challenging. Uh, I assume also in, in pre-ski and these type of things, you should you just need to differentiate um, by skill um, as well. I don't know what you think yourself. It's uh, Finding that right balance there, I think. It's come up a bit, Ivan, here. You know, I think that, I think what you mentioned is sort of keeping them together by age until maybe 12 seems to be something that makes a lot of sense, right? I think given the goals for those age groups, that it's to develop that love of the sport is the most important thing, right? That they're motivated and are loving it is really more important than their skill development, I think, at that age. But then when they get to that point, sometimes the skill ability becomes so great and they start to compete as well at that age some more. And it makes sense to start to um, think more individually about them and uh, make sure that they're in the right group for their skill level because it's time to start to into that train-to-train -train phase, right? To, to really learning the skills that are, meet their um, competition athletic needs. So I think if we were to, we don't have a club wide philosophy on that, but if I think that's something that we would look at and, and you make a good point in jumping in Nordic combined, where that's something that we encounter there specifically, like this question came from one of our ski jumping Nordic combined coaches, where we're, we are doing some grouping, moving some kids up and, you know, to group them together. So they have some more peers to train with. And they're at that level uh, it's appropriate for them as individuals and then makes the group stronger so yeah and you can probably kind of mix it a bit as well for example if we do dryland training maybe you put them in their age group and they do it together with the other ones 
And then if then they go to the hill and do kind of on snow training yeah, in the hill, then they can kind of train in all. But I think kind of I know that the Norwegian national team, for example, they also jump in small small hills. Um, so e even those who are going to the Olympics, they jump a bit on thirty meter hills. So it's kind of I, I don't think you need to jump only in ninety meter hills if you kind of uh, come to that level. I think kind of that they can come down to their own group and be the best ones and really kind of be a little bit show those who are not from that far kind of how to do it and they can have the feeling of being the best in their group. Um, the other ones can learn a little bit from them and then of course they should also be allowed to try out the bigger hills. So it's kind of and just don't make a big thing out of it. I think that's the important. It's kind of what we do is that we you educate kids um, to uh, learn how to do sports uh, and to learn the mindset and the skills that is required to develop yourself from your point of departure. And then um, you just find a good way of kind of building good teams around them, but also giving them uh, mastery on their own level and um, and just be honest with the kids and say why we see that it's kind of this one has come far and, and, and on some sessions they need to get a little bit more challenge so that we put them up in the group but um, on other sessions they will come back and, and train with you i think the kids they understand that and they can handle that and it's you don't have to make a big fuss about it um, because it's suddenly there are someone who is not come that far who will be the best ones three years later. It's kind of they develop so differently in these age ages that yeah, doing too much fuss about it and kind of defining someone as the big talents, etc., is kind of I would tone that down and just focus on helping everyone from the level they are up at. Um, at least. Great. That's good advice. I know, um, Blair, Nicole, I know you both, one of you had a question, I think, from last time, and um, maybe I'll let you ask it. I think it was Allie, but I think she, uh, was, been Allie. Yeah, I think she was yeah. really um, wondering about the appropriate number of days for training, hmm. I think was that um, just... I think she's just considering what we did with U10s and having them train more and because it's just a, such a short period, if that's appropriate or not, they're eight, nine years old, but we only are, you know, we're in the winter time period. I, I'm not sure if that was the question or if there was another one. I think we kind of addressed that last time, but yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about it. I think it's um, hard to give a general answer. It's um, it also depends if they do several sports. Kind of maybe may, in some cases I've seen it's a success that we have kind of for example two sessions a week where that is for everyone, and then those who don't do other activities can come to the third one, for example, that is an open session, um, which is also an alternative. Um, yeah, so it's, I don't know how it is by you, if they mainly do one sport or two sports or, uh, as is here, here in Norway, it was a period where it was kind of so focused on you should do many sports when you're young. And then some kids, they were overwhelmed because they were kind of going to training sessions every day and sometimes two times a day because it was so important to be, kind of do multi sports. And then it, you have homeworks and you kind of have school and it's kind of it's other activities and suddenly many of them have no time to be children. So I think it's kind of it's probably good to be allowed to test out different sports, but do too many sports is also not good because then it will be a stress. So so that's something probably to talk to the parents about as well. It's kind of um so that they can help the kids to at least have one day a week when they 
are not doing activities so they can only play and be kids and uh, uh, so it's not organized kind of every day but it, it, they find a good balance for them um, and if some of them are only doing one sport maybe three days a week it doesn't hurt them um, <clears throat> and at least if they don't do anything in addition to that then yeah I know at least for my kids we have one day a week where we do nothing otherwise it's kind of two or three days a week with organized activities and the other days we go on the mountains or we go cycling or swimming or yeah, as a family and um, yeah but I think if they only do two times a week it's kind of that would be too little activity to really kind of develop their skills that's kind of what we found is you know you add an extra hour or two hours a week and just the level of improvement was so much greater that yeah. we thought well if this is if we're trying to develop the best in our sport then we should follow that yeah we are getting pushback from parents that they say they think it's too many days but that those are also the kids that want to play hockey as well as gymnastics and have piano lessons too so yeah. I think that's the hard thing. Yeah, that's the, that's always uh, the balance. Well, the question was along this. I think one of our coaches asked about the no results for kids under twelve, right? I think I don't know how long yeah. that's been in place, but or you know, if you've even been involved in conversations around that and the philosophy there, but I think that's something that's interesting um, to talk about. Yeah, we it was defined something we call kind of uh, the children's rights in sports. That kind of sport for children should be for children uh, and not for making athletes. Uh, it should be kind of on the on the basis of, of allowing children to have fun and grow passion doing sports, but also kind of learn. The skill sets and kind of when defining those rules, which is was a, a good, very, very good friend of mine that I talked to almost every day, who was the general secretary of Norwegian sport at that time, um, who was kind of the founder of that. Um, and I can send you also some papers that um, we also wrote some papers um, about it just to, 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 because we do believe that at least. For Norway, it was a good thing, and it was also at, at that time when we it was a Norwegian success a little bit started to grow even further. Uh, that this was defined, um, and and the reason for this rule of kind of no result is not. It's, I think kids under twelve can also get their own result. If you jump long jump, you want to know how far you jump. Um, because it's interesting, it's, and it doesn't hurt anyone to get your own results, and you can measure yourself and see if you get progress, and if you can run a little bit faster on the hundred meter or eight hundred meter, or what it is. Uh, but what you don't want is to put focus on the result list and the ranking and the podium, because um, uh, they are kind of enough under pressure as it is, and especially many parents are very kind of. If they see a result list or they kind of uh, can get their kids on the podium, they will be so focused on that. Then those who are not at that level will probably lose a bit of motivation because it's too much focus on those on the podium. And, and, and also we, the feeling was a bit that the direction was going towards too much focus on results and not of kind of developing skills and mastery and having fun. Because we, we saw that kind of why we've done some research also in Norway on kind of why are the best ones best. And then it came back to kind of the inner flame, the passion that they had, they grew as kids, um, uh, the, the ownership in their own kind of sports development, that it was their project. Um, and um, and also the fact that that um, 
they were so conscious about development. They weren't really the most interested in, they could handle results, good and bad results, but a good result or a bad result didn't make them lose focus on, on what was really important to every day uh, enjoy developing your skill set. Um, and when these three things are merged together, it's kind of how can we make a children's sport where uh, they grow that passion, they get that inner flame for sports um, by learning new skills, by being on practice, by being part of the team. Um, at the, so if we can define children's sport in a way that grows that, um, at the same time as they learn the basic skills and you learn them to focus on development and to enjoy development and kind of strive for development so that they are not striving for results because that is just an output of development but they strive for what can give them a development but then at some point this is actually the basis for reaching the long-term good results because if you get that attitude that mindset you can be good in sports but you can also be good in other parts of life um so that was actually the reason for it. it's not that it's dangerous to put someone on the podium but it's the reason why that you want to put emphasis on what is important to learn in kids sport and i i don't think it's kind of the kids, they can handle their results anyway, I think. But I think everyone else, all the grown-ups that are so focused on this, um, might even take away focus from what they should. And I can use an example from cross-country skiing that, that I know well. And I think this is also, even for the kind of the older ones, a problem. I think the juniors, are all, it's also a problem. When they go to ski competitions, um and then the, the day before the parents they are kind of so focused on waxing skis and getting testing skis and waxing skis and it's kind of another thing why do you spend time on this it's kind of why don't you go out and ski the tracks with the skids and ask them kind of uh how they want to solve the track and kind of make that a learning process out of it it's kind of how should we do the uphills and how should we take the turns and kind of do some kind of challenge them to make kind of the entire competition a learning process so they approach that with a positive attitude that they have focus on things that they should uh, maybe set a few goals that they should handle the day afterwards and now when you have mobile phones everywhere maybe as a parent rather should help them when they are skiing instead of standing like this in, in the in the finish area and looking, yeah, you were number four. Should it be better? Rather go out and be there with a video camera and, and, and if they want to see themselves afterwards, they can even see how they skied. Um, and and, uh, and that probably makes them think a bit, well, maybe we can do this even better and ask them afterwards, yeah, how, how did it go these terms that we talked about yesterday? Were we able to solve it as you should? What was the good things? Um, so if you could put focus on all these things, instead of kind of the first thing you do is that you you stand in the finish area and look at the result list. I think then you will eventually make better skiers and they will probably have more fun. Short question, long answer. <laughs> but I don't no, know. Thanks, for, thanks for the background on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've asked a few questions. Are there others from our coaches? One in the chat there. Let me see. Okay. That seems like a great system to support by track swimming such where they can match your improvements without results. Part of the matching from the snow sport to the snow finish. Yeah. It's obviously kind of a little bit um more challenging when you have unstandardized conditions. Um, so it's, um, but again, I think putting focus on development goals is kind of the key. Um, and uh, maybe handling different conditions. Um, and I think it's kind of in kids, you will even, they, 
because they start together when it's small starts or individual starts. So, of course, in alpine skiing, it's kind of you have the terms and you have the techniques, and in ski jumping, you see how far you jump. And is objective enough, I think, for them. Um, they're not blind and they're not deaf, and they, I think, they focus on these results and how kind of they're. That's it's enough of that anyway. You don't have to kind of lift it further up, in my opinion. I even work like that when on elite athletes. It's kind of um, I re I remember when my when I had ended my own career, my wife was still competing in the World Cup, and then I I went out in in competitions with her now, and she she just got disappointed of me because I was so I was. I wasn't enthusiastic enough about the results because I was only interested in kind of how the different aspects went. And, but I, I, I've kind of, I had worked so much on that, working with athletes, coaching athletes, and even on the senior level, that I didn't want to focus on the results. I was kind of always striving to put focus on kind of the tasks that we should solve, the training that we should do to improve, how it improved, because I just knew that everyone else was talking about results and the rankings. I was constantly working towards getting focused on what's important for uh, for the development. And uh, so, so maybe I, I was. So I, even for them, I sometimes I, I didn't even look at the results because it didn't interest me. I was just interested in trying to make them better. On the result, that didn't help me much. Thanks for that question, Josh. Any anybody else have any questions? It's on. And if you do, maybe uh, uh, bring your camera on, maybe so Ivan can see you. Ivan, I have one. If just to fill the space here, I thought that your matrix. This is more for I think older mm -hmm. athletes, but I thought the how to avoid mistakes matrix was very interesting um, for athletes at a little bit older age, I think too, or, or starting to train more seriously. But I like that um, a lot. I think it's a good filter to put um, training planning decisions through for, for coaches maybe of high school age athletes to think about if you're considering a, a training session or doing something new or doing something that's uh, unfamiliar um, to think about what, what are the benefits of this type of training, right? How does it apply to the sport? What outcomes are we getting? And what are the, what are the risks, right? And you can think about this and go, okay, if this is a very high benefit and, and very low risk activity, then we should probably be doing it, right? But if it's a, if it's a medium benefit uh, and the high risk, maybe it's not worth doing. But yeah. I mean, let you talk about that. I, I like that way of thinking about what, what uh, what the content of training is um yes you know you we have a, a good friend uh, both you and me who's called the tunista uh great greetings from, from him by the way he was uh, he was national team coach i think in, uh, in the us and then in germany in switzerland and in norway for several years and we have worked quite closely together over the last years um uh, helping some athletes who really struggled, for example, Didrik Tönset, who was in the World Cup in cross country skiing. Um, yeah, two years totally non functioning, did lots of mistakes there. And then, then uh, that was actually making that we together, I uh, mean, Tron, made this matrix. Uh, well, started that, 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 that's why I found out. Let's try to make it visually because that was basically how we started with Didrik was to. Just try to analyze what went wrong. We had to count two, three seasons where nothing worked. Um, but then we started this work to just see that kind of how can we can we have a tool where we are kind of maybe we can develop a tool based on the failures that he's did, he's done um, that we can use also on athletes before they fail. <laughs> And for him, it was just to make sure that he didn't do the same mistakes again. So we kind of started 
finding out why, why did this go wrong? Um, so let's start finding that out, try to target each of those components so that we, we avoid doing the same mistakes again. Um, because if we, if we avoid, like Trun said, if we avoid doing mistakes, then we can focus on what makes you better. If you continue to do this mistake, we'll, we will never come to the stage that we can get continuity on developing the factors that makes you better. Um, uh, so that was actually the background for it. And then we started developing further, tested it a bit on other athletes, and, and we found out that uh, it's, it, it, it makes a good conversation with athletes, and they kind of open up a little bit. And, and they bring to the table stuff that maybe you didn't know about. Maybe someone who had eating disorders earlier. Uh, and there is always a risk of falling back into that, for example. Um, you can have injury issues that you know that there's, there is a history of injury. Uh, this might, if that happens again, it might be career ending. Then you get all these conversations up. Um, so we found out that then we have a, can map the possible issues. Then we can try to make a prevention, a couple of prevention measures for each of them. Uh, and then we also have a plan B. Kind of if things really go bad, then we have already talked about what we do. So we have a plan for it. Um, and then it's kind of it allowed at least. With a few athletes we tested it on, it has allowed to get continuity on, on, on without too much injury, without thickness, and without kind of falling back into all patterns that limits development. The only thing I think is kind of, I haven't experienced that yet, but we talked about it, is that if then people start be, being afraid of, of, uh, kind of pushing because if you want to come to the next level you also need to push a bit that's why we made this second matrix where we said that okay it's not only about kind of preventing mistakes but we also sometimes need to take some chances but then let's do conscious chances uh the risk that we are aware of the risk and we are aware of the benefits and then when we take them we kind of do it in a little bit more controlled way um, but I can send you these matrix if you want them. I'll send them over so you know, maybe you even can develop them further. Yeah, I, th I thought it was interesting. And I was thinking about how it could apply to uh, a lot of our sports are gravity sports so even here, right? You know, within our club, the majority. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, it's, that's, it's probably more applicable to endurance sports, that matrix in terms of overtraining and risk of um, eating disorders, those type of things that are sort of inherent risks. In, so, injury, for in, example, I think is- Injury, injury. Yeah. that's, I was thinking one there, I was thinking, you know, like adding volume, adding days of, let's say alpine skiing, right? Then you say, well, what, we add more volume, add more training days, add double sessions. There's a, obviously there's a benefit of the volume on snow, but then there's a risk of training when you're fatigued and the technique is not at the highest level that it should be for progression or the risk of injury, as you mentioned, it is higher. I thought about that, how it, that's how it can apply to some of our other sports, you know, here as well. Yeah, and, and just how to think, think about that and go, is this extra session worth it? Is the, is the benefit worth the risk or should we do something else that has a yeah. clear benefit without any risk, that type of thing? I think that's interesting. I've worked a bit with alpine skiing and, and um, yeah, it's now quite some years ago, but, but it was, um, I think some of the parts there that are interesting is also kind of the way you develop technique because if you if you if you don't kind of get the basics right it's kind of then you start developing technique that is it's quite a hard to reverse that um there's also those type of things how do you kind of if you that you don't go too early on details that you kind of start with the basics you get that right and then you build up the technique in the right way, for example, which is um, easy, easy arrow to to do. And then, of course, it's, it's injury that is quite a big risk there. I think if you don't prevent that, uh, and I think also the screening that we did at that time um, to really try to 
for each athlete um, what to find out what are the weak links and, and that might in one or two or three years actually limit your development or lead to an injury um, that you start early enough to kind of prevent that. Um, that that's kind of some of the key things. And I think for ski jumping, I think especially snowy combined ski jumping, we experienced in the last years that of course their weight is a big issue. Uh, and especially for women, we see that if you don't do that in a for example, Martin Lundby, who was several time world champion, she is now also Olympic champion. Um, Norwegian ski jumper. She last year she uh, she's been very open about it. So this has also been in the media. But she uh, had to push. She pushed a little bit too much on weight uh, too early, and then every year she had to push a little bit more. And at some point, she kind of hormonally lost control and went up fifteen kilo. Bang like this. Uh, and she still struggles now. She's been open about it. She's got a lot of help. They're trying to get her back in balance, but I'm not sure she will ever come back. Uh, and she's the best ski jumper in the history of female ski jumping. So that's kind of what they say now is that if they were a little bit more aware early, prevented this, um, maybe it would take a little bit longer, but she could maybe have a longer career um, so it's kind of it's, it's different aspects in different sports and different athletes i think great no even there's a question in the chat if you want to take a look at it from luke brosterhouse who is our mindset performance coach or a sports psychologist with the club so in the um, research is there any reason to begin on a long term event in the risk of injury? Does athletic literacy potentially protect against injury down the road? Probably on top of the research. It's a good, very good question. Um, I think kind of this kind of the risk of injury and kind of It's, it's a hard thing, and it's not done lots of research on it. I think what they see is that um, if it's kind of, if you kind of train, at least in sports where there is a large risk of injury, it might be, for example, alpine skiing, if you kind of, I think there are some research on it as well, I'll, uh, from uh, Greta Miklubust and uh, that uh, has shown that too early, so too much specialization without also kind of doing the basic training in alpine skiing might increase the risk of injury uh, because you need to balance both kind of the basic dry land training, strength training, flexibility, injury prevention exercises as the basis to ski more. So you need to find the balance of kind of when you increase the specific part of the training that you need to do, you need enough hours on snow. Uh, you also need concurrently to increase um, so that you, you kind of increase their strength, you check their flexibility, you, uh, you, yeah, have have make sure they have control in the movement. They are strong enough to do the do it, and that they are trained to ski so many hours. So it's kind of they don't get injured because they are fatigued uh, after x number of runs. Um, so I think that's that's of course important in the long term that you have kind of a good idea of how you build up physics uh, and the ski specific skills at the same time. Um, and of course, athletic literacy is, um, I think it's um, in athletic literacy, then you kind of mean, do you then, what do you mean by athletic literacy? 
just so I really understand. Um, yeah, I, I was just curious. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay, yeah, sorry. I was just curious kind of about, you know, there's definitely this idea um, around, you know, developing movement skills that are fundamental movement skills yeah. and then sport specific skills. So just kind of that idea of having fundamental movement skills at a young age, yeah. like are those, you know, are those helpful in preventing injury down the road? It would seem that, that maybe they are, but certainly I think to your point, the specialization is, is kind of the question, are we, are we losing some of those fundamental movement skills because we're specializing kids too early? I think that's kind of the question I'm, I'm curious about if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think as I said, I think it's, you need to do it concurrently. So if you increase one of them, increase both kind of, so you can gradually build up both factors at the same time. It's at least kind of how we've seen it in Norway. And, and I think I saw some research on that those two kind of increase the specific stuff too early, that they can develop unique skills. But then of course the, the forces acting on them is also so strong that it's easier to get injured and also you kind of you do get fatigued so if you don't kind of have the strength and endurance to sustain entire training sessions but you have unique skiing skills the fatigue might be injury related so i think yeah i don't know if that answered your question yeah, that's great. Thanks. Appreciate it. No, but it's good. It, these are good questions, Dave. Uh, is, uh, How do you how do you work with uh, kind of uh, how many kids are there in each of the groups that you have kind of training groups are there many kids in each training group or are you how how, how many do you have per per coach eight that's really good I would say it takes some work to find the coaches yeah on that one yeah to do that. So that, that's a really good point of departure. I think it's kind of you have time really to get to know them and help them and support them and give them good feedback. And... Yeah, and I think it's something that's I've seen interesting between the traditional Norwegian model for snow sports specifically, I think I know skiing is it's mostly parent coaches. At, at the young ages, primarily, there's we have a different model here. Very quickly, we have more paid or professional coaches. You know, even at the high school level, I know you know in Norway that you'll have one lead coach, and then you'll have a lot of parent coaches. You know, as the second, third coach of a of a program, and um, it's different. I know there are cultural differences there that allow for that. Obviously, you know. Um, that are probably beyond the scope of this conversation a little bit that, that dictate those things. But um, I kind of wonder if, if to segue into it, there's some things that you see within the Norwegian system for sport development across all sports that, that can be applied well to the US and that are not sort of culturally dictated, right? That it's not everything's fit. We, we're not Norway, right? The US is it's very different here in Colorado than, than Norway. We have different expectations, different cultural practices right but are there things like broader things that you see being very applicable to uh and that's a great article yes i um and we can all share that too even but it, I, there's some things along those lines that you think about that you go this is something that's not that we do in norway but it's not specific to norway i think you to start kind of on the, the children's there i think i just shared the paper that i I wrote with uh, a couple of friends. Uh, it was asked by this Aspen project um, that I think is an interesting project to start off. No, I think I think um, what is good and it's kind of what I like is kind of I do like these called what we call the children's rights in sports because it's 
it puts focus on what I think is important. It's, it's of course, friendship and enjoyment should be kind of the basic mastery. Um, uh, also that the children should kind of be get ownership in it and have influence on the activities and in, that they are involved. And I think that's really good, as you say, you have eight athletes per coach. It's kind of a, new, a good possibility to involve them. Um, and um, and I think, I think kind of some of these things are really kind of important to take into account uh, just to make sure that they can can get those skills that I talked about. And I think that's, it's not something we always do right in Norway. As when I'm in my home club, we struggle with this all the time, but I, uh, and especially some parents are really kind of obsessed by getting their own children higher up and someday even go criticize the, the, these uh, children's rights uh, and say that it's limiting their kids. But in the end, when we see kind of those who, to um, uh, continue as coaches in sport, or those who are really reaching a high level in sport, they really come back to these things. It's kind of they talk about uh, what they learned through sports. Um, and uh, for example, if, if you ask kind of the best athletes we have in Norway, it's kind of, I think, um, to have a very if you've been in a team where they have a good kind of training philosophy, I think is it's very clear for them what is needed to get progress um, in their sport. I think that's important to kind of take up kind of what is what is good training and what should we do and what should we do on different levels. Um, and that's also why we have kind of forced a bit. Uh, each sport that should kind of get help from Olympia Toppen, which is kind of a support system for across all sports, that you should have kind of a stairs of development um, and uh, that you build up kind of step by step uh, what skill set you should learn um, step by step. And I think that's that's something that has worked very well. It makes uh, I've been involved in developing that for biathlon and also for cross country skiing. It's kind of what should you learn kind of on the on the basic level when it's kind of you provide a fundament and then you should learn you, you probably know this long term athlete development model from Canada. So it's a little bit like the same, but also to build up kind of skills step by step. And then many people that think about okay what should we kind of, how much strength training, how much endurance training, how much should we do in different steps? I think that's just a part of it. I think it's kind of what type of attitudes should they learn at different steps? Kind of to, to if you on each of these steps, can you define kind of what is, what is, what is the skill set of a coach for a 10 year old? What is the, what should, what, what should, uh, what, what are the social aspects of being in a team that you should learn them by the end of this year? What is the the technical aspects that they should learn uh, at this age? What are the type of tools that are good to use to learn them that but pedagogically during this age? What are what, what is the 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 physical aspects that they should learn? And also, what are the kind of more health prevention aspects that we should be aware of? And then you come to the uh, kind of the next step, uh, and then kind of have kind of what are the different type of skill sets that we want to learn them step by step. Um, and I think I think that's at least when I go into elite that is very retrospectively to see kind of what did they do. Uh, there are always a few exceptions, but kind of ninety eight percent they fall back kind of that. They actually did most of it in the right order. They learned the skill set in the right order. Um, and maybe that's why they didn't get injured. They maintained passion and in the end, um, they came out of it with 
positive experiences from sport. So, but we actually forced uh, uh, the federations to have that. Um, we want each of the clubs to have that. Um, and it's a continuous struggle because you're always challenged by example, unique examples. Now we have the Ingebrigtsen brothers with Jakob Ingebrigtsen, for example, who is running very fast. And he's done it in a little bit special way because he was an elite athlete at the age of 13. <laughs> His two older brothers were both European champions and did well in the Olympics. And then he he took after them and he, he kind of from himself wanted to be good at the early age. So it came from his inner flame, but he started much earlier than what you would recommend to <laughs> athletes. So he actually followed a bit the step by step uh, there, but he just started on a much earlier age and kind of uh, everyone else. And that has been a problem now in, in athletics, I think, because many parents are pushing their young kids to try to be like Yoko. Instead of saying that you don't need to be European champion at the age of, it was double European champion, 5,000 and 1,500 meters at the age of 17, which is in the senior age. And he was world champion at the age of 19, and now Olympic champion at the age of 20. So it's kind of, for most kids, that would be five years delayed, kind of, um, which is probably the most secure way. I don't know if that that's more the, the, the Hendrik Christopherson model there for Alpine, a little bit maybe too, to as a comparison, someone who's far ahead at each age, I think in his development too, right? Yeah. yeah. Hend Hendrik is, is also very special. Uh, I think he's, um, he and his father, they started at an early age to kind of build him up. But then it's kind of, and he was so good for his age that he didn't want to train with the other ones. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing was that uh, now he's not the best slalom skier in Norway. We have two others who are similar good or even better, but they kind of follow the normal pathway. Um, so I think it's um, there are diff different pathways to the top. I, mean, I think there's a good question in the chat. Uh, if you yeah, have, can take a look. On the world stage in track, track and cycling, whereas prior there was mainly sort of alpine skiing. What I think is, um, and this is something I've spent uh, lots of time with because I this kind of track and field and cycling and endurance sports I know very well, um, and I've been a lot in contact with. This, Team Ineos and uh, Team Sky, and over the years they are having the testing in the wind tunnel in Trondheim, so we know them very well. Um, and it's friends of mine who are team, team managers there, also in track and field, that we have a good network internationally. And what I what I think is has been developed very well in Norway in these endurance sports is that we they have a very good basic training philosophy. Uh, uh, it's kind of the basic principles of training is very sound, uh, very, and it's based on a high volume model uh, with um, with a reasonable amount of high intensity training. But then I think kind of um, the way they are coached when that model is is. Um, is very good. Uh, the, the athletes have quite high ownership in their development, so it's kind of a very balanced coach-athlete relationship. So you have a sound model model of training. Uh, it's a lot of training. It's kind of it's quite extreme training in many sports. Triathlon, for example, that I know very well. It's kind of they are doing it well, and then it has been also scientized a bit. Or what do you call it? It's it's kind of quality, the quality assurance of it is quite kind of, although the athletes have ownership and you're very interested in the perception of the athletes, you also uh, um, quality assure it objectively. Um, 
So it's been kind of a good mix of art and science, I think, in the in the way of developing endurance athletes. That, and then we have unique possibilities in Norway because we have kind of it's a small country. We have Olympia Toppen where kind of these the track and field and the cycle, cyclists and the cross country skiers they kind of meet at these Olympic centers, train together, learn from each other, and it's it's not a big environment. And the coaches they know each other. Um, and we as scientists, we are also good friends of them. Um, so the last study I worked on, uh, or I've done now, for example, is that we have interviewed the, the 12 most successful endurance coaches in Norway over the time, so those who have contributed to most medals, um, and, uh, and both quantified and in their training philosophy, interviewed them about the coach philosophy and the training philosophy. And then we kind of will share this with them to try to facilitate learning across sports. Um, I think it's kind of, it's not a simple answer to it, but it's kind of developed the performance culture around endurance where it's kind of, I think they motivate each other and they talk together and they learn a bit from each other and then the ball starts rolling. But then, if I should criticize us, and then you can ask why is it only male athletes who are on the world stage? It's kind of one of them. We do say that we are one of the nations where it's kind of equality between men and women is on a societal level pretty good. But in sports, 72% um, of our Olympic medals are won by men. Uh, and even now we struggle on the female side. Um, so there we haven't been able to develop the same type of performance culture, um, which is something I think has a large potential for further development. I mean, something you just mentioned that you talked about last week that was interesting was the quality assurance being a fundamental part of long-term athlete development. And I think we're all pretty familiar with the uh, objective quality assurance, assurance, the testing, right. To see the, see the progression. I think that's somewhat self-explanatory, but the subjective quality assurance, I thought was really interesting and that feedback from the athletes. And I wonder if you could give some examples of how of some type, what are some examples of subjective quality assurance when it comes to athlete development? You mean more the subjective uh, tools? Yeah, I think, exactly. I think it's kind of, I can try to, to exemplify it. For, for me, it's just, if it's, if it's just take it by the start, if I should have coached an athlete, the first thing I would start saying that is kind of if you want me to be the best coach in the world for you, you need to help me. You need to coach me. If we are going to work together, I need your help. I need to know kind of when you're tired. I need to know, uh, understand your motivation. I need to, um, I need you to be honest with me when you kind of struggle. Uh, if your boyfriend or girlfriend is breaking up with you, or if you fight and don't sleep in the night, uh, I don't know, need to know the details, but uh, we need to take consequences in the training. Uh, and if you kind of went drunk in the weekend and are not able to train on Sunday, you don't meet up, then you call me and you kind of tell that you fucked up and you can't meet up on the Sunday training uh, and we're honest with each other. Because I can force, I can cannot force you to be good, but uh, I can, uh, I can be a good coach uh, if you if you are honest with each other and um, say things as they are. And then I need a good tool. I want you in the training diary to to actually be honest and say how was your form, how was your mental and the physical readiness to train, which is subjectively perceived. How was your RPE, your rating of perceived exertion on your training? Uh, how did you sleep? How was your sleep quality, your resting heart rate, and your 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 uh, how many hours did you sleep? Those type of things I want to know every day uh, because that's the way you can play me good. It's your perception 
but we need to quantify them a bit your perceptions and then we need to talk to talk to each other um and and i want to come to that level that when i hear your voice of the three words i know how you feel that's how we can tune the system if we if i want to bring you to the highest level as an athlete we need to match the training every day so it's optimal for the for the outcome i can't give you the perfect training plan it's impossible i i need to tune help you to tune that training every day so and that's i would say is a much stronger uh, uh tool than any doping uh that uh, hopefully no athletes use today but we still see that some do it because your hormonal system is fluctuating a bit uh, if you're able to play the training your everyday life uh, in an optimal way so that you can tune training um, uh, optimally for for kind of how what your body is able to adapt to then you will kind of get so much more more out of each training session than just following a training plan so that's how I would work with an athlete. Um, and then I just have to say, I have to learn to understand how, how you function, how you adapt, what's happening after a strength session, and how you feel the day afterwards, how you react to two tough sessions after each other. Um, and in the end, this will also change uh, when we kind of, if your training history change, you will also adapt a little bit different. So it's, the learning process never stops um and when we think that we have found the optimal pattern then we haven't because that will change because you continuously develop this is a learning process that we need to do together until we stop working together and if the athlete is interested in that um then you can take out the full potential but then you have the diary you have the test you have the standard sessions and we have the system of objective data and then you have the conversations and, and then i would say you need to see the athlete uh now and then i like myself personally to now i don't yeah, i coach a little bit a few athletes but uh, i like to go out to run with them um because then that we are you see their body language and you see them in their eyes and you kind of feel the their their uh, emotional states a little bit um yeah so it's this type of things that I, now we are you can't do this with kids but you see your kids and you see how they react and you see how they behave and they have good days and bad days and um, we should always take also take them seriously but of course you can't work with them like i talk about now that's something on the highest level um but um but I think that's something the best coaches do. Um, Great. Well, I think we maybe have time for one or two more questions. There are some out there. Maybe not. No. Yeah. Well, anything, you know, thinking through this conversation, anything come to your mind, Oivind, I think from based on the presentation from last week or from the types of questions that we're asking and that uh, you feel is valuable to, to us? No, it feels like you're, I think uh, just the fact that you take all, off all these things. So it sounds like you're doing a really good job. Uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, it's um, you, you ask good questions and you put emphasis on things that are are really interesting. So I just appreciate to ha have the possibility to contribute. Uh, so so I have I have a very good feeling of how how you work at least. I think that's 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 also an important take home message. It's kind of like. Um, it will never be perfect uh, 
and I can say that I'm uh, I'm in the same club as Johan Sklabo and Magnus Moan in Nordic combined, and uh, and we have kind of in Trondande we have lots of good skiers, and it's um, we struggle. Although it's kind of it's not perfect, but the fact that these things are discussed is up to date. It's then I think kind of that's the important thing. Uh, if you have arenas like this and maybe also learn across sports a little bit. Um, I think that's really good advice. Yeah. yeah. Don't expect that it should be kind of a perfect coaching environment that all coaches are functioning optimally all the time. And it's kind of, it will be a continuous struggle. Um, and my, my experience is that if you don't detect the challenges along the way, then you have a problem because then you're probably blind and you don't have a good correcting system. If you struggle al along the process, you're continuously working, there are things not functioning and you kind of, then you're a bit, it's a, it's a sign that you're on the toes. There are people who want to get better. Um, everyone are not always agreeing. Skills or age, how should we do it? These discussions, you probably will never solve them, but keep having them. <laughs> Well, and it's something I think I see from the outside about the Norwegian system is the the humility and the, the openness about training and the, the sort of openness that it's not all figured out, that they're always trying to become better. It's something that I see is somewhat unique, I think, culturally from other other nations and skin ski nations that it's, there's, there seems to be this um, focus on just improvement and getting better. And even though if you are the best, that it's... Uh, you realize that you can't just sit there and uh, mm -hmm. that that'll be the last time you'll be the best, right? There seems to be this culturally, this focus on progression across the organization, not just for athletes. Like how do we, how do we get better next time? How do we take the next step and not just rest on the laurels and talk about how good we are? Uh, that's my experience at least. And it's kind of, it's, it's kind of, what do you say? It's like uh it's like a marriage. If, if 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 the marriage looks picture perfect and everything's perfect on Instagram, it's probably lots of struggle behind that um, that they don't show. But if kind of if it doesn't look that picture perfect on the outside, and you you struggle, you work with things, and you continuously develop. In the end, it might lead to very good results. And that's my experience. It's kind of don't try to make things look picture perfect on the outside but make sure it's a good process where everyone learns along the way Aaron has a question I think yeah thank you uh, I mean oh thank you um let's see I, I had a couple of them but maybe if it would be helpful if you could talk just a little bit more I I was interested in that competition as part of training and maybe at like the U13, U15 level, um, do you have any, you know, other things to say in regards to that? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's maybe, if I could, if I could go, go back in my own athletic career and change something, it would be to really kind of, enjoy the possibility of competing because I think uh, I think uh, it's so cool to go out there and kind of feel to make sure that the kids really try to help them to enjoy the competition as something positive to help them to set goals that they want to achieve and not the result but really kind of things that they should should handle. Um, for example, if they're very nervous in the competition, make sure that that's seen as something positive. It's kind of, a, it's kind of like I think the feeling of standing on before the start and having butterflies in the stomach and think about all the hormones that are kind of going crazy inside your body. It's so much energy there. It's so much kind of passion, energy, and it, it's like that because it means something for you, something you worked for. It's something you want to do well and help help the kids and athletes to to enjoy that, 
to see that as something positive, to see it as an energy. Sometimes it's kind of, it kind of, the energy goes in the wrong direction, but that doesn't matter. What can we learn from that? Instead of seeing that as failure, saying that, okay, now it kind of, for example, you're nervous. The, the fact that you were so nervous, it made you not functioning so well, but it's so much energy in there. You have so much passion for this. How can we make this something positive? What can we learn from it? Make that kind of into a learning process. And I think if if we as coaches are able to always try to ask questions, making it to a learning process instead of success or failure, there's it's so cool to compete because you you came home with some positive things or some things that you can learn from and, and do better. Uh, then it, it's it's a good arena. Um, and of course, if you want to continue with this over time, it's kind of, it's it's better to make it fun than make it uh, <laughs> like a, a neg negative experience. So that is kind of, and of course you compete quite a few times over the year. So if you kind of, if you learn something new every time, at some point you probably get quite good at it. That was kind of my well, like yeah and I think thank you to be honest I'm 41 years old now and I kind of I try to train one one hour a day on average because I love training exercising and I love sports and I grew up with it but uh but uh I think I'm better now to use it as a learning experience and now when I was a kid because of course, now I have to talk about this. I have to practice my own preach, but uh, but it's so. I have to admit, I loved I loved exercising and training because I set myself new goals, new challenges on a low level, obviously. But it's kind of just going out there and kind of see how your body responds to things, uh, test out a new challenge, even go out with the kids and have fun with them. This weekend, I'm going doing my first sky running competition in my life. Um, I think that will be quite tough, but uh, how can I make that something positive? <laughs> so, and the reason I, I, I actually go to this competition is that my kids are also competing. So I just thought that instead of standing in the finish line doing them, it's 200, start is 200 meters from our house. So why, why can't, can't I go compete myself and I'll probably be in the middle of the field and I show I show them that competing is cool <laughs> so doing it by example but uh yeah providing such a culture then I think yeah then I think the kids will continue longer and some of them will at some point be good great thanks Ivan Well, Ivan, it's getting late on your side and um, I appreciate your time very much here um, and uh, valuable lessons for us. So very helpful. And Aaron, do you have another question or? Um, I mean, I, I had some written down here. So I guess another question that I have here is, um, I guess in a sport that, that happens at a little bit younger, age how do you how do you kind of cram that in like some of the freestyle sports really you're seeing just younger and younger athletes being successful at younger and younger ages and it kind of pushes everything back um i do you have any comments there when when it when it comes to that i mean i kind of write down these questions and then i answer them in my head but um i'm interested in what you have to say about that I think this is a challenging one because if I could, if I would challenge back, if you look at gymnastics, for example, that was had the same pattern many years that there were younger and younger kind of athletes competing in the world elite. Uh, and that was, it was almost like if you're not good at the young age, you can't kind of reach the world cup. But that pattern has actually changed. And I think kind of a few nations actually changed a bit the attitude that. Um, 
that they kind of built more physical, especially on the women's side, that they built more physically strong gymnastics, um, helped them through puberty uh, in a good way, because very often the puberty came, they were pinched because then they changed their body. Help them more kind of in a good way through puberty. And then now we see that much, you still have some of the young ones, but kind of the majority is at the older age and that they, their career lasts longer. Um, so I think it's kind of in such sport, it's kind of, it's very dangerous to say that you have to be good at a young age. I think you then would lose a few that are not, they are not matured or not motivated to do all the training that is needed to be good at the young age. Uh, <clears throat> but maybe they'll, that will come later. So, so I would probably say that it's, it's not dangerous to be good at the young age if it comes from the inside and if they want to do it and it kind of, then you just need to help them to get the right stimulus. But um, I think it's dangerous to say that you have to be, because I, I, I struggle to see why you can't be good at the age of 25 or 26 or even 30 in these sports. I don't see any physiological reason for it. Um, so, but I do see that it's possible to be good at the young age if you start early. But maybe my hypothesis will be that you can be, if you kind of maintain motivation and build up training, right? Um, peak performance will be a bit later. But uh, if you don't get injured. I don't know if I answered that question. I think it's, it's a hard one, but. Uh, it is a hard question to answer and it's just, yeah. So thank you. Yeah, that was good. Great. Well, Ivan, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks coaches for joining and for your questions here. And um, this will be recorded so I can share this back out as well. And I'll share those resources, uh, those resources so even that you shared as well, the Aspen Institute article yeah. is great on children's rights and sports as well. And um, I think the new, newer Norwegian um, uh, Ski Federation long-term athlete development model, which has that Canadian system, which we also are adapting, adopting here in the US, that same phase progression as well. Uh, send that out to, to kind of links to a lot of these things I think you're talking about. So, and if there's anything else you'd like me to share that connects to what we talked about, I'd be happy to push yeah. it out to our coaches. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, think about it and see if I have something I can ship over. Great. No, well, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I just said thanks for listening and for the discussion. Great.